and welcome back to the Not So Fit Couple podcast with your hosts, Lucy Halden and Benjamin Halden. So on today's episode, we have a, a bit of a different podcast. We're going to be reviewing our favorite books. It's often a question that hits us on social media. Always. And if you guys are into podcasting and self-development, I think some of these will be really useful because I think the worst thing that you can do is waste a load of your time reading something which you don't enjoy or which isn't relevant to you. I also think as well, the ones we've picked, we've made sure we haven't crossed over because we have read a lot of the same books. And sometimes when a book is a bit overwhelming, and I've definitely picked like more, not necessarily self-development, but they kind of are, but very like businessy, self-development-y kind of based, basically not storybooks. And they're very digestible. So the ones I've definitely picked in particular are easy to digest and I can remember what's in them. And that's why I want to share them today and go over like basically the summaries. And I'm assuming you've you've pretty done, pretty done, you've done pretty, um, you've pretty much done similar to what I've I've done. That's fine, you know, I'll tell you when I've done the books. Okay, do I go first? Well, this is the quick one, Harrox program. The season is going to be coming to an Ooh. opening in October. So we will shortly be 12 weeks away, which is where you should start be looking at programming and training as me and lucy will be as we compete in our first come together mm-hmm. if i ever get over this injury mm-hmm. so again we will leave links to a few of the high rock programs with overviews which gives a full explanation of what's included in the program the splits and some messages from the coaches so they're also from beginner to advanced yeah. and obviously including the doubles program so there's four different programs plus additionally about 70 extra workouts on the app that you can use with my coach because we're a digital partner of high rocks the price is ridiculously good, basically. I won't say what it is, but it's 85% cheaper of normal high rocks coaching. So have a little look via the link below. Any questions, just let us know. What we will also be doing for Birmingham High Rocks is we'll be having a meetup there for the MyCoach members. If mm-hmm. you are part of the app and you have done one of the high rocks programs, we're going to be having a meetup area, which will also allow for a MyCoach bag drop, which means that you don't have to use the one in the high rocks event, which is an absolute nightmare, which is also super useful. Yes. But... Rock, paper, scissors, see who goes first. The books. So is it one, two, two you go on, go. Three. So you go one, two, three. Go. And then do it. Okay. When I say go. Three, two, one, go. Fuck sake. Not first. I so. didn't know why I did that. I never do scissors first. That was a stupid idea. Yeah. You go first. I, Where's your book? I'm going to pick it up. Oh. Give me a chance. <laughs> Put on the I've, I've never really been much of a bookworm. So if you're not a person who's massively into reading and you just get into reading, don't worry because I've never massively enjoyed it probably up until until recently. And even as a kid, I was never a big fan of, of reading either. I think like I mentioned before, one of the worst things for me was just wasting time reading things I didn't necessarily want to read. So hopefully this will give you a mix of things that have really helped me in both fitness with my body and also help develop my mindset. And I've taken value from that you can add to a wish list. So the first one. Oh, yours are on the floor. Is Essentialism by Greg McEwen. You may have heard me speak about this book before. Uh, I'd say it's probably the book that has changed my life the most. As it gives a lot of actionable guidance that you can apply to everyday life really easily. No matter what you do, no matter who you are, no matter what your career you're in, no matter what you're doing for fitness, no matter what your hobbies are. It's a book which is going to help you build confidence. It's a book that's going to help you declutter your life. It's going to help you have the confidence to say no to people more and protect your time and ultimately strip away a lot of the things from life that you you don't need. I've read this book three times. Three. That's and a lot. I think, and this is one of my tips, that you're always better off to reread the same book sometimes over... You hear some people, was, was it, I do like him, but was it Jay Shetty who said he reads? He said he read 365 books in a year. Yeah, so a book, book a day. day. Yeah. Which and we, actually, yeah, can I, shall I explain what he actually yeah. said in that? Because that actually threw me off a little bit. I thought it was really, I like him a lot. It was really annoying because he read basically like a page of a book a day. And that was it, yeah. And that was it. Like that's, that's not reading. Three, don't say you've read 365 books yeah. in a year when you didn't. You read like a page. Jay Alderton had the best quote about that. I still remember it from the podcast. He said oh. that that's not self-development, that's shelf development. Yes, so, I love that. 
Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just, it's eager. I think Ben Shapiro does similar as well. He says he reads three books a week and it's... Sometimes it takes me like two months to read a book. I, I think you're better rereading things and digesting it, especially if you found it useful first time and then you can reaction stuff rather than just building a, a weaponry of books to say that I've read three million books. Mm-hmm. What's the point? If you can get more out of 10 books, then, then do that. Um, so with essentialism, read it three times. And the reason for that is whenever I find my life becoming overcomplicated or stressful, I reread the book. Uh, and there's a couple of notes that I just made on the book. And Greg McEwen basically boils down these problems into three main issues is that in life we have too many issues we have too much social pressure and also discuss the idea that we think we can have it all Mm -hmm. um and we always want more but we are poorly prepared to accept it when we get it so we work harder run faster sleep less and complain more our pursuit of success can be the catalyst for our failure. So it's it's talking about the pursuit of more, but how can we ultimately strip everything back? So I'll tell you the first thing that I did one, once I read this book was I went into my wardrobe. I binned probably 50% of my clothes because one of you the- You didn't wa- bin it. We gave it to charity, actually. Yeah, but ben put it in bin bags and yeah. I gave it to charity. <laughs> Is, if you've not worn something for six months, it, it goes, you take out your wardrobe. Yeah. Um, I immediately decluttered the whole office. I started- clean all my things up, the things that meant I had value to me. I went into all the kitchen cupboards and binned a load of the stuff that we weren't using or gave it away. So it, it kind of helped me declutter because when you accumulate crap in your life, you just hoard it for the sake of it. And it can mentally clutter you or take up time or take up space or take up energy. So that was one of the things from the book I did straight away. So I thought you were going to ask a question. No, I was going to say, I remember you doing it the first time and it was, very, it was, whoa, it was like he saw red. It was like, I can't have anything. Um, so it was, it, you were quite extreme the first time you did it. And there was just like three bags of, which is actually fair. Three bags of clothes were great because we could give them to charity and you gave a few to your friends. Um, but I do think it's a good thing to do. I do it often. I do big clear outs and I give it to my friends and they give it to their friends and they give it to their friends. And then the last one, it goes to a charity that um, is in Chester. But I think it is a really good thing to do is like give things away to people when you're, when it's, it is almost cluttering your life or like a, a busy desk or whatever's on it yeah because even things being around you makes you stressed you know Mm. that's why when you go into places which are really minimalistic which is the the premise of essentialism you know even like the apple store it's super clean super clear you feel more creative in those spaces that was a big thing but probably the main point just to finish off that i took away from this book is greg McEwen states if you don't prioritize your life someone else will Mm -hmm. and this is the biggest thing that we allow a lot of people to do and i noticed I started to pick up on this thing when I think I was sat in the barber seat one day and my barber had asked me to do something and I knew I was going to be busy. And it's those times where you go, oh, I might do, or maybe. And then what happens is you stress about it because then you have to come up with an excuse to not do it. And what happens then is you're stressed and now you've also got to let someone down Mm -hmm. as opposed to just saying, no, I'm busy or no, I can't. We're all programmed to be really agreeable and that sort of predates to a, a, t- a time where there's a lot of tribes because we didn't want to be the outcast because if you were the outcast from a tribe, you'd die. So what you did was you conformed mm. to a high level to, to say yes, to stay in the tribe so you didn't die. So there's, there's an element of that there where you're just conforming with social pressures and social norms to want to fit in. So it's all about saying no more so that you get back your time as opposed to agreeing things that you don't want to do anyway. I'm not saying, you know, be a selfish such and such, but you need to make sure that you prioritize things that you want to do and fill your glass first. Yeah, because saying no, it's well hard, isn't it? You don't want to offend people. I often say like, oh, I can't, I just need to, I need a bit of me time. It's one of the the ones I go for now and actually works really well because people respect that you have, you sometimes need your own space. Um, I've actually never read that book. It's actually just not one I've read. It's in my top two books probably. Top two. I don't know if it's because we have quite different personalities. I think I started it though, didn't I? And I was like, this one's not for me. I love it. Love it. Great book. Okay. My first book, and I know this would have been on Ben's list, is Atomic Habits by James Clear. It was actually one of the first like self-development help books. It's not really businessy, but you can apply it to business that I had ever read. 
And I've read other books about habit changing and habit forming and utilizing it into your life. And they've never stuck. Atomic Habits, the way he's written this book is so smart because it's very easy to digest. Now I have, I have so many notes in it because I mean, I read it ages ago and I can still remember most of the things from the book, but one of the things he speaks about, so he talks about goal setting. He predominantly talks about habits, good habits and bad habits, which I'll explain slightly so you get the gist of the book and how you can integrate it into your life. But a lot of the time he talks about how small habits can make such a huge difference in your life. And it's really easy to overestimate the importance of one defining moment and underestimate the value of making small improvements on a day-to-day basis. Now, when people say, oh, improving by 1%, it doesn't seem like a lot. Um, it doesn't seem noticeable. 1% could literally be having an extra glass of water a day or, I don't know, hitting your step count or whatever it is if it's fitness-based. But it can be a lot more meaningful, especially in the long run. And he basically says in the book, the difference a tiny improvement can make over time is astounding. And this is basically how the math works out. If you can get 1% better every single day for one year, you'll end up 37 times better by the time you're done. And I just think it's really interesting because you never look at your 1% and on a day-to-day basis, you don't look back at things, especially with habit forming. So this is predominantly about making habits and those 1% improvements every single day. And if you kind of flip it, if you get 1% worse each day for a year, you'll decline nearly down to zero. And when you look at it that way, and that's how far you can go in the other direction, I think it is so important to focus on getting 1% better every day. And I think that's why I really resonated with like the goal setting and the habit forming of that part of the book. But one of the really big sections is he explains how to build habits in four simple steps. I love it when a book gives me four simple steps (laughs) and it breaks it, isn't it? Rather than just loads of words. Um, like I said before, sometimes it will take me two months to read a book. Like I don't want to like the thing before, oh, I, I read four books in a week. Congratulations. Like we don't need to boast about it. Some of us are slower readers and that's absolutely fine. If I'm reading a rom-com, I could read three books in a week. I shit you not. I just fly through them. But when you actually want to take on board and remember things in the books, it doesn't matter how long it takes you to read. So there are four laws of behavior change that, James Clear basically describes in the books and it allows you to create habit loops by different cues, rewards, responses, and your habits then become automatic. When we're creating habits, when I say that it could be working out, it could be hitting your steps, it could be going for a run, it could be entering a race, it could be cleaning, it could be stopping biting your nails, it could be working in a set block could be getting off your phone there's so many different things with habits and there's four laws to create a good habit i'm not going to go into all of them because i think you should just read the book the first one is the cue so you've got to make it obvious i'll give you an example you're getting up at five o'clock in the morning to go for a workout put your gym clothes right next to your bed on the floor second one make it attractive Again, we'll use the workout scenario or a goal. Okay, so you're going to do that and you'll hit your goal by doing the session and after it, you can have something. Very easy uh, craving. Third law is response. Make it easy. Have a program to follow. Get someone to do something for you. Put your coffee out on the side in the morning or your pre-workout. Basically have everything made for you so you can slip out of bed. And then the fourth one is the reward. So you've got to make it satisfying. How is that going to make you feel? And All of these can be flipped in the opposite way in terms of breaking breaking bad habits, which I think, to be fair, is always a little bit harder. We all have bad habits. We all 100% do things that we don't want to do and we can't break the habit. So the first four that I said to you, you basically flip them in reverse. And this is how he's written them in the book. And I think it's why I can remember it so well. So the first one to break a bad habit, make it invisible. Second one, make it unattractive rather than attractive. Third one, make it difficult. And the last one, make it unsatisfying. So all these habits you can switch around. So if, I don't know, um, you could relate to food, I guess, a little bit, couldn't you? You might be going through a really bad cycle with like binge eating or something like that. Move the cookies, put them away, hide them, make it unattractive, don't buy them or whatever it is. And you can just flip it in different ways. But 
honest to God, I have never tried to summarize a book so much in my life. I think it'll be one of the most viable books that you read. And that's why I put it as number one. It's probably not like, it's not a story. And I've got a couple that are, but in terms of value, I think it's great. I think it's a good I one to great. start any self-development journey with. Mm -hmm. I often recommend it to my clients because in, in ter especially in terms of habits, a bad habit's not a bad habit until it happens two days on the run. Mm -hmm. You can easily break, break cycles. And with a good thing to imagine is to try and imagine that the, the person that you want to become. So, you know, that person might be a fit, healthy, wealthy individual. What are the habits of that person? Because if you can put habits in place, you'll become it as long as you can stick to them. So, mm -hmm. yeah, really, really, really good book. Really good book. Okay. Number two, I don't have this one with me, unfortunately. I think I gave it to someone. Uh, I try not to do it as, as often anymore with my books because I want to try and keep hold of them. But it is from quite possibly my favorite author, uh, Mark Manson. And it is a subtle art of not giving a fuck. <sighs> really That's really, a good, really good book. i think the reason why mark manson is so good by the way and, and you can go and watch him on youtube as well because he's got a great youtube channel and i think the reason he's got a great youtube channel is because he's such a great speaker mm -hmm. and he is a super intelligent carl's just pulling the book on screen now um he's super intelligent but he also speaks with a, a tone of relatability and actionable steps for the real world and for for everyone and i uh, i know i haven't got the book because i listened to it i listened to it many 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 years ago we do have it do we yeah no because i've read the physical okay. book well i listened to it and the reason why i listened to it i started listening to it on the day that i crashed my car uh and i lost my laptop i thought this is the worst day of my life the recent time you crashed your car no do you mean the bmw on the roundabout yeah carl's got it yeah <sighs> so i started listening to it then when i've had I'm a really sorry. really bad day because the, the whole notion of this book is is learning that nothing really matters and it's about boiling things down to its absolute basics to to almost the fact of is anyone dead mm -hmm. no well it doesn't really matter then it's about how much those things you know those mornings where you sometimes wake up and you feel shit or you've stood on a plug or something's gone wrong, it, it really helps re-engineer the way that your brain deals with problems so that it's like, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Um, so it's got a lot of key, like, actionable takeaways from the book. And it really, in that time where I was, I was down, helped me think about my bigger purpose. I think that's what the book's great at. Mm -hmm. It's about, it helps you really think and it helps me even today with with business it helps me think about what i often refer to as my north star so what is the end destination that i want to get to and whatever happens in in between that is is not is not an issue or it's just a hurdle or it's just something that we've got to steer around to get to the place where we want to be and the main thing that matters is your end goal so i have pulled up just a couple of quotes from the book because i think one of the things that mark manton is known for is is, is real Right. snack bite quotes and you'll probably see well you can often see them on twitter if you're on twitter as well um so a couple of quotes from mark and they're usually quite hard hitting as well you and everyone you know are going to be dead soon and in the short amount of time between here and there you have a limited amount of fucks to give very few in fact and if you go around giving a fuck about everything and everyone without conscious thought or choice well then you're going to get fucked so super simple advice which when you're in a moment of despair or stress or anger, you sometimes just think about those quotes and think it doesn't really matter. Or what I'm doing is actually digging myself a deeper hole by giving it energy and giving it time. I think Mark's really good at helping unpick that and give you perspective and context and stand away from being so close up to a problem. Yeah, it's almost a lot of people are like, oh, will it matter in five years? He's a bit more hard hitting than that. And it really, I loved that book. I might reread that one, actually. That's a really... One more quote. And this was, I was thinking about this one the other day on the bike, actually. Life is essentially an endless series of problems. The solution to one problem is merely the creation of another. It's the story of our lives. But what people think <laughs> is, people think when they have issues in life or whatever the problem is, whether that's something that's gone on financially or relationship, whatever it is, people think... 
oh, want to overcome this problem or earn this or do this, life is going to be so, it's life just going to be flat with, I'm going to level up to this new level. And on that level, it's just like that. There's no problems there. No issues exist on that level. Mm. It's fucking not. The more, the more you progress up the levels, there's still problems on every level for you to unpick and unlock. Just because you overcome one doesn't mean that there's no problems ever in life again. Oh my God. Yeah, completely. I just, yeah. How funny is that? Because even like with businesses, I think it's, you solve one problem. <laughs> and it's like, go on, pass me the next. But I think that's what makes business so like exciting and risky. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a never ending cycle of fun and problems. I also don't have my second book, which is really annoying because Ooh. I've, I do give people my books to read. Um, but I probably do need to stop doing because I started making notes in them. So I can imagine if I give someone a book, they'd be like, why is it? I do make a lot of notes in my books now and they'll be scribbled all over them, which is why actually I'm going back to my Kindle for a bit because you can re read notes. Anyway, my second book is Breath caught by James Nestor. I don't actually know if it's, it's pronounced breath or breathe. I think it's breath. I'm, I'm sure that's definitely breath. That's not breathe. Now, my mum actually recommended this book to me. And it is one of the best books that I have ever read in terms of physically the effect it's had on me. And when I say physically, it's improved my fitness. And that is a wild statement to make, but it's actually true. I've read a few, it's got a more scientific background, but he has done a lot of research into studies and he's done an experiment in himself in the book. And he talks about people doing it in terms of mouth breathing and nose breathing. But it's so digestible to understand what he's saying. I've read Why We Sleep Before. And that was, I found that really confusing to read. Like certain chapters of that book, it put me off reading it because I was like, I don't, I don't understand. I keep rereading the page. Whereas with breath, it's very digestible. Now, it basically goes into the general consensus about how bad mouth breathing is for you. Now, if you're listening to this podcast take a moment for me and is your mouth open i just immediately stopped sort of in there. <laughs> most air. people whether you're driving or you're sat there you're sat with your mouth open you're breathing through your mouth and when you read this book you best believe your mouth is shut when you're reading it and you really concentrate on nose breathing he ba he breaks the book down into loads of different chapters so you've got like the nose exhale slow inhale he has all these different chapters and I'm obviously not going to go into too much detail, but for example, in the chapter nose, he really describes the benefits of nose breathing at the start, because as humans and as we've evolved, we've naturally started breathing through our mouth and it's actually not that good for you. We obviously speak through our mouths a lot of the time, but when you're talking about nose breathing in, in general, it cleans the air, it warms it. It moistens it for easier absorption. And you actually take in more oxygen through your nostrils than you do your mouth, which really shocked me because like they're so small. Like your nostrils seem so much smaller than than your mouth. And this is around the time as well when Ben was wearing like nose strips. And you'll notice a few people wear nose strips and it's because their their nose and like, the, is it like, what's it? The, ca the cava? Capillaries. Oh, no. Oh, oh. I think it might. What do you say? Cavities. Is it cavities? No, that's sinuses? tea. Yeah, your sinuses, people have like collapsed sinuses. So if you struggle to breathe through your nose, it's probably because you're a mouth breather and you've been doing it for so long. Just on that, um, mm. for people who are wondering about the nose strips, I use ones called intake breathing. Again, there's no sponsorship or plug or anything like that. They're just really strong uh, yeah. plastic pieces with magnets on that actually pull your nostrils apart so you can actually breathe. They're the ones I wear for running. And I always wear for competing in high rocks. And I've actually found what you just discussed there in terms of nose, nose breathing, super helpful when I'm doing the eggs yeah. to bring heart rate down. Yeah. So that's actually nose breathing responds to the cycles of the autonomic, autonomic, auton, autonomic nervous system. So it influences your heart rate. So it will lower your heart rate, it mm -hmm. opens blood vessels and it actually stores memories. Don't know what that means, but that is just a quote from the book. So when, oh, when I'm memories. when I'm running, I do a lot of my easy runs now only through my nose. I've not I've not been as good as it recently. Um, but I started off by like in through the nose, out through the mouth. And it's definitely harder. And they do loads of experiments in the book that are super interesting in terms of how it affects your physical fitness. So 
I, I actually do have quite a low heart rate now when I run. I think people forget like I'm not just like fit when I run. I'm also doing things to improve that all the time. So nose breathing, I think for me was one of the biggest things that I ever learned. And one, well, I'm not going to go in. I could talk about this book for hours. We actually will try and get him on the podcast. I think it'd be so interesting, but there's a chapter called exhale and it talks about the importance of your actual lung capacity. Now, this is just a fact that I need to share with everybody because I think it's really interesting. A study that collected data from 5,200 participants over 20 years, so it's a really longitudinal study, found that the strongest indicator of lifespan, this is how long you live, is not genetics, diet, or daily activity level, but lung capacity. Our ability to take full breath, a full breath is literally a measure of your living capacity. Well, do you know the, the two... How mad is that? The two main metrics are for... Well, okay, there's two different metrics. One, the biggest indicator of life longevity is VO2 max. So mm-hmm. that ties into that because obviously you've got bigger lung capacity. And two, the quality of your life as you age will be dictated by the amount of muscle mass that you're able to maintain. Because one of the biggest killers in old age is sarcopenia or one of the biggest yeah. sort of contributors to lack of quality of life is sarcopenia and muscle wastage. So yeah. VO2, VO2 max and being jacked. So basically be a hybrid athlete for the rest of your life. So this is why right. you should be on the My Coach app in general. But how mad is that? We're not taught that. We're definitely taught about diet and exercise and breathing because everyone breathes as as a human you don't even think about how you're doing it so if you're mouth breathing you're gonna have a drop jaw your breath's gonna smell you literally you're in like this you can't breathe properly you're not taking as much oxygen you're taking in more carbon dioxide it's not good for your hormones it's not good for your blood pressure it's not good for your heart and i sat there reading this book and i thought oh my god so i do a lot of nose breathing now it was basically and i want everybody to read that book i don't know if you can pull this up carl but there was there was a study done, Hubman's referenced it a couple of times in regards to the, they did a study on a girl who was mouth breathing, breathing and then she started nose breathing and it changed the shape of her face. Oh yeah, like there's a the, picture. Her jaw and stuff has changed on the skeleton, I think as well. Um, I think there's a couple of studies on it as well, where you can see the the actual skeleton. I mean, I think he's ref, Hubman's referenced a couple of things, but the, there's a, I think there's a podcast where he discussed it and he actually pulled it up where there was a girl and you could see her jawline. Mm. Uh, which is crazy, by the way, that you can change the shape of your face. Is that her on the right? I can put it on screen mm. so everything's. Oh, it might be actually. Yeah. Yeah. So ah. after on the left and then before on the right. Yeah, yeah. So you can see that. I mean, you can see where her chin and stuff is. Oh, well, yeah, it's your eyes as well. Your eyes go back a little bit into your head if you're mouth breathing. Yeah. Um. That's why a lot of people tape their mouth at night. Well, I have good. done that, but I don't do it as much. Do you find it claustrophobic? I, I did at the start. Way, yeah. yeah. I did I at the did. start. I got really stressed when I was running, like really stressed. Wait, you um, taped it while you were running? Yeah. Oh, taped, your, taped your mouth. I've I thought done, you meant just sleeping. No, no. I've done it on runs. I'm quite used to just being through my nose now when I run. It's like why my heart rate is so low. It, it's definitely hard though that like I'm not saying do that straight away, have, but. Have you ever seen Jake Dearden on a flight? I've, I've had a, I think I've been on one or two flights with Jake Dearden and he looks like a zombie when he's flying. He has. For context, who's Jake Dearden? Uh, Jake Dearden is. Probably one of the best hierarchs in the game. Uh, we'll probably get him on the podcast actually at some point soon. Yeah. Good lad, Jake. I did a YouTube video with, video with him for the week, a race with him in Berlin, men's relay. But, but he puts headphones on and puts the rain music on, which yeah. I don't know a few people do. So the big beats ones. Then he puts his eye mask on, which he's got this mad one, which does moves, I think. And then he puts this massive mouth tape on his mouth as well. Does he? he looks so funny when he flies, yeah. Oh, I should do the mouth tape when I fly. Yeah. You're you're quite bad for a Yeah, well, my nostrils like flies. P- pistols in the snow. Yeah, I'm the type of person that you could put a set of car keys in my mouth when I'm on a plane. Mm. So. But that's, I think that's why it's good to recycle through books because there's habits that you want to implement and you sometimes forget about them that we all do. Rereading, even a couple of pages sometimes can just jog mm-hmm. your memory. Okay, on to the third book. I do have this one with me. Dun, dun, dun. And as you might be able to see on the screen, this is actually quite a short, small read. Love Again, this book. have you read it? Yes. Yeah. So it's a really short, Jen short something. read, and I like these sometimes because I I do my reading time in the morning between six and half six, and that usually includes making my coffee. So sometimes I'll even only have fifteen minutes in the morning to read, but I'll always do it. 
So ha- sometimes having short chapters, which I can do in 15, 20 minutes, I can think about the chapter, which is kind of what this book is. So it's called You Are a Badass by Jen Sincero. Really, really good Ew. read. And it's probably one of the books which is most relatable, one of the most relatable self-help books, I'd say. And again, hit me in a time where I needed it in terms of creating confidence to take action. Uh, and did I read this in lockdown? Yeah, we both did. We both I bought lockdown. it. I read it and you read it. Yeah. And remember loads it was, from it, it was a, fair. it was a brilliant, brilliant book. Um, and I think a couple of things in terms of favorite thing, favorite three things took away from the book, um, are decide you'll stop caring what other people think, but do it right now. So it discusses that topic about how we often, I mean, it's, it's, it's natural for us to, to think about what other people think, but she speaks about how you can stop worrying about what people think of you and start taking action on life. Because I think one of the, I even spoke to someone in the gym the other day. So did a high rocks worker on Friday empowered and uh, a guy came up to me, just, oh, I watch a YouTube channel and stuff. And he was asking me about getting into online personal training. And we were kind of discussing about putting out content and things like that. And, I think he's just a bit worried about what other people would think and how you get over that. I think it's often the biggest hurdle to most people mm-hmm. doing something new is the fear of the judgment of other people. So I think one of the things that Jen is great at is breaking down that fear and how you can put things in, in place so that you can get over that fi- fear of what other people will think because it stops a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing that I t- took away from this book is um, figure out what you want, but don't obsess about it or how you'll get there. I think a lot of people will set goals and become so obsessed with making the perfect process that they actually just procrastinate on it and don't do it. And also not enjoy it. Yeah. So Jen often just talks about get, set the goal and just get stuck in, get the shovel out and get in the dirt and get after it. And I think that's a great ethos to have because you see so many, I mean, especially if you're in in the, the content creating game and things like that, you'll see the guy with, you know, the stereotypical perfect lit desk, with the, the two MacBooks and huge screen set of headphones and the best camera in the world. And people think, oh, to be to do that, I need to have all this. And they procrastinate over things. And Jen really breaks down just doing the thing. Yeah. Just getting out and just get it done. And I think for a lot of people, they will, there's a couple of chapters in there that are super useful on that. Number three, if your habits, surroundings, and friends don't support you, it's time to change them. This is a concept that we've spoken about a lot of times. And again, just because I think of how relatable her language is in the book and how she's not afraid to put a couple of swear words in there and really just speak from chest. She, <laughs> she's, a, she's, when I was reading it, it's one of those books that you laugh to a little bit while you're reading, uh, yeah. which I think is nice sometimes as well. When, especially if you're reading the book, which is a little bit about self-development, it's sometimes oh. nice to have a bit of a giggle along the way. And again, Super, super short read. It's one of the New York Times bestsellers. And there's, I know a lot of people read this and, and took quite a lot away from it. It's a great book. Actually, I've not read it in like five years, four years, whenever lockdown was. Um, I might, yeah, reread that one again. My third book, I also don't have with me. I actually did. Do you know what, Cal? I don't know it's if I actually terrible. borrowed yours. Oh, yeah, when we were away. And then gave it back to Cal. I think we were on holiday and you did yeah, borrow it. Yeah, it was Lanzarote. Yeah, yeah. Was it a Cal recommendation? Yeah, Cal read it when we were away, and I then th- Cal finished I it, and I read it. Yeah. Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. What a book. Oh, my God, what a book. Actually, two of my books are autobiographies, and I must relate to autobiographies for certain people. So it is the autobiography of Knight's founder, Phil Knight. And Sorry, just on that, how many autobiographies do you think you've read? Off the top of my head, I can think of like six. That's interesting. Probably that, more. That's probably the only autobiography in the top 10 list. Is, no, is I've it got not? two. Oh, okay. I've uh, spoke too soon. Two. Um, and it's the story of how he founded Nike, which is, of course, one of the most iconic, profitable, and world changing brands, I think, in the world. Nike or Nike? I say Nike. It's, he, he clarifies this in the book. It is Nike. It yeah. is Nike. Yeah. I think that's why I've said it since then. As a kid, I always said Nike. So did I. And uh, I do agree. Adidas Nike. or Adidas? 
Again, I also I think Adidas. I also said Adidas. Yeah, kid. Adidas is the. But it is Adidas. Yeah, it is. Where we grew up, then. That's, yeah, that's where it's from. Adidas. I think because sort of I know we're not scousers through no, and through, but plastic scousers. Yeah. But people, scousers like to shorten everything as much as possible. I think, and whatever the shortest way of saying it is, always the one that I'll go for. Sure. I think this is one of the most interesting books I've ever read because I think autobiographies, when it's someone like Phil Knight who is one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the whole world without a doubt like he founded nike it's absolutely incredible you take so much away from it and i don't know if i really resonated because i'm an entrepreneur and i have businesses but i don't think that's it i think anyone who reads this book would take some sort of inspiration or motivation from it whether you're putting it into your own work or you do have a business or or whatever it is it's such a fantastic book because it wasn't easy for him and he went through a lot of hurdles and different things that happen in the book. Obviously, I will not reiterate the whole thing because it is so long, but I would have never known his story unless he did this autobiography. There were three key lessons that I will, I've i pulled from it when I went through it the other day. And just to share a few things. So lesson one, you only get a few chances to start something crazy. So go broke. So go for broke when you're young. And he literally was broke. Like he honestly had nothing and he had this passion for running. And again, don't know if that's why, I just think it's so fantastic, but the way he's so open and honest about having no money and wanting to start this company. And he actually didn't know what he was doing, which is also quite nice to hear that he is now obviously so successful and has been successful for years, but he was broke and he didn't have anything and he didn't know what he was doing. The second lesson, get someone who can be your mentor and partner and will believe in you and bring valuable skills. That's the second thing I noted down from the book because he explains having those important people in your life with business through and through and you go through hardships together. You can almost kind of say in the same breath, but kind of not not, not a book, the um, Wolf of Wall Street, where Leonardo DiCaprio, who, who, who what is his, Jordan Belford, he has that set group of people who are actually his ride or dies. I know what he did is well rogue. I'm not relating to that, but people who are like your partners through and through. And he has specific people in the book who are literally his ride or dies. And I think that is really powerful and really important. And I could relate to like us three in a way as well. I think at the time, like we were in Lanzarote, we got stuck there during COVID and we're, we're, we're filming the app in a gym taking our masks on and off. And it was just like a whole moment. I was like, we've, we've, we've got this though. Like it's absolutely fine. We can get through anything. The third lesson, just tell people what to do and let them figure out the how. Encourage everyone to be themselves. So a direct quote oh. from the book, you'll love this quote. Don't tell people how to do things. Tell them what to do and let them surprise you with their results. I love that i i think about the pink elephant thing with that you know when you say something to people and then you've already put thoughts or ideas mm -hmm. in their heads which then stop their own thinking process yeah, yeah. Like so that. it's not you're not telling them how to do it you say what needs to be done or what to do and then they will surprise mm -hmm. you with with the results and you you go back and forth with stuff for sure but i think that's incredible because that's one of the ways you learn and this obviously what has made him a really good founder and the way that he's worked. But the, the, the underlying pinning thing of the book is his like obsession and passion for running, which is obviously where the footwear came about. And he was really like rogue and unique. He built a shoe which had fish skin instead of leather. For example, like one of the, the random examples that I wanted to use and he just didn't stop. And I just, I think it's a great book. I really resonated with it. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And yeah, chew dog. Tonight. One of the parts in that book that really stood out to me is Bunker. that he made, sorry, Ben. Yeah, he made a, a shoe in his, they were they were experimenting with ways to make the sole of the shoe and they ended up putting rubber into a waffle iron. And that's where the Nike waffles no get the name from. Way. Yeah, the bottom was made in a waffle mm -hmm. iron. Yeah. That is fucking, that is so innovative. And I you can buy that nowadays. That. You can literally go to JD and buy yeah. a Nike waffle amazing. ones. Yeah, yeah I've, even, sorry, I've, only, I've only watched the movie. and Is that the Jordan one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that was good. brilliant. Yeah. I, was, I guess yeah. that was I, I mean, I know people were endorsing sports athletes anyway, but 
that was the real pinnacle, wasn't it? The way that Nike yeah. started doing it uh, with athletes and yeah, with, with influencers and things like that. And it was in, obviously Jordan's career was incredible and they got on board with a really young athlete at a really good time and built a product around the athlete instead of doing it the other way around. Yeah, it's, I don't know if you've actually read that book. I've not read it. Honestly, Ben, you would I know I'd enjoy it, yeah. It's even like, you know, the Nike swoosh. The girl got paid $50. I know, I have read that. Didn't she get a, a She reinvest? has shares. Yeah, yeah. now yeah. she's worth like fucking bajillions of pounds. Yeah, she has shares, which is again, $50. but again, because How he, simple. He, he literally had nothing. $50 and I'll give you some shares in the company. Yeah. What the fudge? This is where you've got to be careful about what you're giving away at the start of anything because you don't know what it's going to become. Well, yeah. no, so he only gave her $50 and then I think when Nike was successful, he then rewarded her with shares. Yeah. It wasn't like... Ah, was that? Got, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, $50. Do you know, I just quickly, um, oh, there's an artist called David Chang, maybe, I might be butchering that, who um, uh, was asked to paint a mural at Facebook's headquarters. I've heard this story. And was offered 20 grand or shares. And he said, oh, fuck, I'll just take shares, whatever. He's now worth, uh, I think think somewhere in the region of a hundred million dollars <gasps> because of some drawings he did around facebook hq yeah insane david cho maybe it's interesting this, isn't cho, it? when people yeah. sometimes i mean there's i know there's a lot of people in the investing world just because it's something that we've been oh my god heavily exploring Sorry, at the moment. worth 300 million oh my god yeah. i'm going to become an people, artist people often take on sweat equity for stuff um and sometimes Whoa. it's obviously super worth it like that it's a good time sweat equity i like that yeah i like sweat equity sweat equity yeah no like stop butchering it loose that, I, that, that was cal go on Lucy, <laughs> butcher it. I've, I've not read the, the reason why i asked before is because i've not read too many autobiographies one of the Ones that I do remember reading uh, years ago, it was brilliant, was the Paul Gascoigne. Uh, Who's that? Oh God. Come on, let's come on. It's one of the I, England, I English greats. I would never greats. read that. He played for Everton and he was just an absolute, you know the way that you like Jordan Pickford because of his character? Paul uh, yeah. Gascoigne was a lunatic. Lunatic. Okay. Um. Yeah, really, really, really good read because you read a lot of the stories. He used to just prank all the players and stuff. And what what he did on one of the occasions was, I can't remember who he was playing for, but they were playing against Derby that weekend. And for some reason, both the sets of players were staying in the same hotel. For, I, don't know, I don't know if it was a cup game or something, because that would never usually happen. And the other team was apparently out on the lawn at the back of the hotel. And Gascoigne from his hotel window, I don't know why, had an air rifle with him. And he shot the best player. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> so he couldn't fucking play the next day. That's so he'd go insane. to prison. Yeah, he literally. He didn't like. Well, I, thought, I don't know what would happen, but there's just some stories, and you think, how has he got away with doing shit like that? He was just so wild. Uh, but there's a documentary out as well on Gascoigne, which is both hilarious and sad. Hilarious so, and sad. Yeah, autobiographies. Not read a lot of them, but that was one of the good ones that I read. Mm -hmm. Okay, is my book number four? We, we have two more each, and I was going to say we're going to have to be, be through. better on our summaries because this is how excited we are about the books. Okay. This is how excited we I are. I won't tell you too much about this because we've had the author on the podcast. the podcast. I'm so, so glad. And it is Mo Galdit's book, Solve this the signed one. for Happy. Is it? Yeah, this is my signed one. Yeah, so show the camera, Liz. Shall I read it out? God, yeah. what is it? No, yeah, you're right. Dear Lucy, what a wonderful human and inspiration to many and to me, Mo. So nice. <laughs> Mo is on uh, genuinely one of the the, the best people that I've Ever met in my met. life, I think. And yeah, sort of happy with the podcast with him a year ago. You can go back onto the podcast and listen to that. He talks about the book. And um again, would love to be able to get Mo back on the, the show. I won't talk about this book too much just because I think one of the main takeaways is so simple, which is you can't hold two emotions at the same time. So you can't be happy and sad. So if you hold, if you're holding a sad thought, simply the thought of a happy thought will mm -hmm. change that because you can't hold both at the same time. And there's four key points that he sort of mentions in the book, which is observe dialogue. So thinking about your thoughts, there's observe drama um, and acknowledging it. There is bring me a better thought, which is what we just spoken about in terms of when you've got those thoughts of unhappiness, how can you pin something or a happy memory in your brain? And then we've also got shut the fuck up, which is saying to the brain, the brain is not me. I am not my brain is a different person to me. And you need to shut that down because you would not speak to yourself the way that your brain speaks to you. Mm -hmm. And they're the main concepts that I took, I took away from the book. So I'd really recommend 
uh, any of Mo's material in general, any podcast that he's done, but definitely make sure that you go and listen back to the podcast that we shot with Mo Galder. Yeah, we'll link it below. He also has the softest voice and the most amazing voice yeah. ever. Like you could listen to him for hours. And he had us all crying when we shot yeah. the podcast as well. Don't say why though. Um, okay, my fourth book is Oversubscribed by Daniel Priestley. I have just finished reading this. I've read, it, I've read it twice actually. And I actually think I wouldn't recommend it to everyone. I would recommend it to business people. I've read it three times. Yeah, I just think, I don't know if it's because our app is also a subscription model that we literally like take so much away from it itself. But sorry, that's not why the book's called Oversubscribe because it's about subscription model no 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 it's about the central idea of oversubscribed is to maximize your business's profits by making sure there's more demand for your product than you can meet so it's basically a, a supply and demand situation going on and how you can create your own demand in a market i won't go into it too much because it can be a little bit it's not complex because you can i really sit with this book really and i simple. go through it and uh, this is actually ben's copy which is tattered and it all has scribbles his scribbles all over my my other copies actually downstairs just on that sorry one of the best things for, for when you're reading books like this is to have a highlighter and pen yes there's been a lot of studies done both on the pace in which you can read and also how much you can remember based on making highlights and also scribings in the book yeah now when you're one of the biggest things it talks about that i definitely took away from anyway is when you're releasing a product i guess with like average interest you wait until you have oversubscribed in interest in your product before you release it by providing ways for people to signal their intent to purchase. So it could be through a waiting list. It could be through a Facebook group. It could be through so many different areas. And then when you release it, a lot of the time you do a limited audience and you're oversubscribed. And he goes through seven different principles, like ecosystems, working out your capacity and what you can do. And I think if you have any product or service or you're, you're a sole trader or whatever it is, I think it's a fantastic book just to, even if you take elements, you'll never take 100% from a book. You could just take 5% from it and it could really stick and there could be one key element that really sticks well with you in the book. So I would recommend it to people, I think more so entrepreneurs, sole traders, that sort of thing. Do you know the first time I read this book? Mm. And I'll say it's probably for the this is made for that person is when I became a personal trainer. Yes. So your personal trainer trainer. is really, really good book to read. And the reason I'll say that is because when you start personal training, you learn about anatomy. You might learn about mental cycle. You might work about exercise selection. The thing that you never learn about, which is a real shame is how to market yourself as a personal trainer. So if you're a new PT or if your PT has been PTing for 10 years, this is honestly one of the best books I ever read for building up my client base because people don't, People don't buy what they want to buy. They buy what other people want to buy. Yeah. And what that means is, and I've done this before, and I have no shame in saying it, is that when I was starting personal training or online personal training, is that I would release uh, a product or a service or a new program. And I would not long after say it's sold out. And I I remember one time I'd only sold two two people on on the program. And what that does is it makes the program feel and seem busy when you relaunch it. And it's a little bit like going out and looking for a restaurant that you want to eat at. People are much more likely to join a queue because they know and trust that that place has Mm -hmm. buyers. So that again, buy what other people want to buy versus you could walk into a restaurant straight away and not have a 30 minute wait, but you're taking a gamble on a place maybe or may not being good. So really simple, simple, useful tool. And there's a lot of those takeaways in the book oversubscribed. Yeah, he talks about that in the book, what exactly Ben has just said, and then eventually you'll get to the point where that's not the case, Mm -hmm. but you all start from somewhere. So yeah, it's fantastic. I won't go into too much detail on it. Okay, it's my final book, is it? Yeah. It's your final book, and then I've got my final book. I haven't realized how thick this last one was. There's a reason why this book is in my top five, but is number five. This could potentially be my top one or two book is the eighth that understood the universe by steve stewart williams who is a behavioral psychologist and professor in one of the universities in america and like lucy's 
mentioned the other day, this is a heavy book. It is a heavier read. And it might not be for absolutely everyone. Uh, it is definitely, if you're into understanding more about the human mind and evolution and genes and why we think and do the things that we do, this is fantastic. And mm -hmm. I did psychology at university. And if you're, in, if you're looking to read something which isn't about developing yourself or fitness and mindset, this is honestly one of the most interesting reads I've had. And it's actually for an evolutionary psychology book, relatively easy to read. And Steve does make quite a lot of jokes in the book, which make it a bit funny. And there's a lot of relatable stats in there. Uh, one of the, the kind of the leads in this sort of space is David Buss, who's been on the Rogan podcast and things like that. But his read on the handbook of something, something is a lot harder to digest. Um, he, he starts off with uh, talking about the first chapter with Darwinism. And one of the main questions that runs throughout as a theme with the book is if there was an alien race or an alien in a spaceship that passed over Earth, what would it think? of just looking and not listening to human beings and how would he be able to report back to other aliens of what was going on and why human beings acted in the way that they did. And that just makes it really relatable for the everyday person thinking and reading about the book, um, which is just great. It, it, it goes into a lot of myth busting about things that we think about our bodies and our mind and why we do the things we do in terms of things to do with pregnancy or decision making or relationships and sex and childbirth so honestly i said to cal before is there, is there a book that i'd recommend for you it would be this yeah it's a fantastic read yeah evolution is very much something that i uh you know did my degree in something that i'm very interested in so i'll give that a go evolutionary psychology is really interesting yeah it's it's, it's a lot about our genes and why we do things and even that thing of the survival of the fittest and why we think the way that we do and why that we act the way that we do mm -hmm. and what and how we how we've come from a place that we are but even still now one of my favorite stories that he tells in the book is about how we are in this social media stone age or how we're flintstones in a social media social media stone age and the the thing that he references is that things are happening so quickly in terms of evolu evolution at the moment that we are really a gunfight with a spoon because he references how hedgehogs have evolved and the discussion and debate that he makes is around how hedgehogs you know the way that a hedgehog rolls into a ball mm -hmm. yeah. to defend itself because it's got the prickly spikes so that's a defense mechanism for a hedgehog and what the what a hedgehog will still do is if it walks out onto a road and sees a massive truck coming towards it, it'll roll up into a ball because it sees and senses a threat. So but the thing that hasn't evolved yet to do is know that that threat is just going to roll over it instead of scuttling off the road and being safe, which it would have enough time to, because it hasn't evolved. It hasn't evolved at the speed that technology's evolved at. And that's very much the way that our brains are with social media. It hasn't evolved to the level and the speed that technology has. And it gives some really great analogies which help really understand evolution so if you're interested in it definitely give it a read it's probably one of the books i've made the most notes in ever it's about my whole book is highlighted up to death and and notes i took it away on holiday so if you go on holiday and want an interesting read definitely recommend that's not one i probably read to be fair <laughs> That we did actually say a more accessible version of it is called The Chimps Paradox, which is 100% probably my favorite book in the world. And I've not read it in so long that I didn't write it down. But Chimps Paradox, also read. Um, my final book is Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. So another autobiography, which I didn't even realize when I was planning it. I read this, I think it was during lockdown. Stay hard. Yeah, and it's a memoir written by David Goggins. And I think it's extraordinary. You love all you hate the guy. I love him. I think he's absolutely brilliant. He, this book is actually, it has a lot of sadness in it as well because it talks about his really, really difficult upbringing. It's poverty, it's abuse, racial discrimination. He had a really difficult relationship with his dad, which he actually goes into in the book, like an abusive relationship. And he he emphasizes the impact that these experiences had on him shaping his mindset and essentially his life and things like that. And he's just, he's done so much that you wouldn't actually know just from basing it on social media unless you've read the book. So I know he's done like the ultra marathons. He's done 
I can't remember what it was, like the number, it's over a ridiculous amount of ultra marathons. But the Navy SEAL story that he went into, he did the SAS, the Army Ranger, the Air Force. And I find him quite an inspirational person, not quite a massive inspirational person, because even when you just listen to him talk, it just makes you want to do stuff. It makes you want to go and run an ultra, go and run a marathon, do something crazy. And I do truly believe that you can change your mindset by listening to different people and what they've been through and his experiences. And, you know, he's been through a lot of hardships, but just about like not giving up and digging a bit deeper. And obviously the thing that I see all the time is like going out there and doing hard things. And then you kind of, you see what it's like when you get to it. And he really goes into detail on these stories, the way he describes everything. And I think it is absolutely fantastic. So it is completely another autobiography. It's quite, it's quite an easy read. Um, I think it's fantastic and I would recommend it. Probably if you're in like a bit of a lull with like motivational, inspirational, kind of like where you're at in your life and you, you don't know what you want to do or deciding different things and you just need to do that one thing and push yourself. I think this is a great book. I think it's, everybody. I think it's good for people who are on a running journey because yeah, it's, running. it's so relatable and I didn't read this book, but I listened to it. And the great thing about it is that David Goggins uh, doesn't actually narrate it. It's another guy that narrates it. I can't remember his name. Oh, really? Yeah. And basically what happens after each chapter is that they both discuss the chapter like it's a podcast. And he asks David Goggins some questions on the audiobook, which is why it's so good. I love that. So try and listen to it. It's really good. I think one of the reasons why it's quite a good book is because it ties into something called comparative suffering, mm -hmm. which is basically where you go, well, this is bad, but it could be worse. It, it, it helps you have some downwards gratitude. And... I listened to both the audiobook and several of his podcasts in the 24 hour world record challenge that I did on loud. And we all yeah. had a good giggle over the, the nighttime piece because he's quite actually quite funny as well. Yeah, it's it's a really, really fantastic book. I love it. Uh, just a bonus book quickly before we sign off. I thought Chips Paradox was a bonus book. Bonus book is called Brain Over Binge. Yes. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I get asked about it often and it is by uh, Catherine Hansen. Uh, is the book that I read when I had and um, was in the midst of my eating disorder and was one of the resources that I used alongside therapy when I was at the worst point in my life and also wanted to take my own life. So I'm not going to tell you, tell you too much about the book uh, because it's not going to be for everyone, but it's a super powerful resource if you are really stuck in the midst of an eating disorder. It's not mm. the solution to it. I would definitely go and seek professional help, but... I think reading something that's relatable to a problem that you're dealing with at the time can be super helpful. Absolutely. I I always have two books on the go, you know, and that's a really weird thing to do. But one is kind of like what we've been through today. And then one is more of like a rom-com. Just started reading Normal People by Sally Rooney. Obsessed, love, absolutely unreal. I'm well too deep in now. And those sort of books that I can read in two days, like I blitz through them. Whereas these books, they do take me quite a long time to read and I absorb them. So yeah, hopefully today you will have found a singular book recommendation. You can go through them all and just see what's best for you. We'll also pop them in the show notes as well. So you can actually just get the titles. I think the reason why you can't blast through these is because of self-development books. That yeah. you've, got to, you've got to think about them. But I again, I don't really read any fiction books, which I should probably do. Uh, so this is basically 10 self-development books, essentially. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. But thanks for listening, guys. Hopefully this was helpful. Make sure you're subscribing on YouTube, Spotify, leaving reviews, asking questions. We love to hear them, we chat about them and we appreciate you as always and we will catch you in next week's episode. Bye guys. Bye. Right, I'm going to put the shoot. I'm soaking as well. I don't know why I'm sweating so much. It does get hot. Right, I'm going to go eat a sandwich and then